So what amazing, uh, outrageous things are going to come out of this room tonight? We'll <laughs> see. I, I hope uh, there'll be a lot of surprises, and I hope that each of us will leave here with uh, some way of having an impact on the world that we hadn't thought of before, or expressing ourselves. It's kind of magic to be in the same room together. It turns out, you know, I asked uh, a neurologist friend of mine if it was possible to empathize on paper or on the screen to produce oxytocin, you know, that allows us to empathize with each other. And she said no. Really? Right. Wow. So it's important that we're together with all five senses. But are we really talking about the same thing? I mean, there's, there's the whole history of, um, of letters, in particular fiction, poetry, and then there's an illustrious history of film, which is a medium that's what, barely 150 years old? And uh, so what are we experiencing when we read a novel and or what are we watching a film? What, what, what does she, what does she call that? Well, I'm not a neurologist, but I think, <laughs> I think that what happens is that we, we connect and we learn and we understand, but we don't bond. Mm. Mm. Because the, the oxytocin, the tendon befriend chemical that we produce because we're now together with all five. For instance, when when people, we didn't, we didn't think we were going to talk about any of this, right? So in a minute, we're going to get to the point. <laughs> but um, there's oxytocin, which is tendon befriend, and testosterone, which is fight or flight. Mm. And all human beings have both. So when men pick up a baby or care for children, their oxytocin goes up. And when women are in combat, their testosterone goes up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that's what, what she was talking about. Mm. Um, now we've already done one unexpected thing in this room, so I <laughs> hope we do a lot more. <laughs> yes. Um, I was just saying that I thought that Bill is the most rule-breakingest person mm. that I have ever met in my life. Mm. Obviously, it's clear the rules you had to break in this country from the dominant idea of various hierarchies, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems to me you also break the rules of the people who break the rules. <laughs> this is a Gloria construction here. <laughs> um, and this book also breaks the rules. Mm -hmm. So since a book is like a person, it has a history, it had a birth, a life, could you, you tell us how this came to be? You mind if I just read about it? Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll read a bit about it, and if you would like to know more, we can certainly um, read more or talk more. I, I, I have a lot of words. I'm trying to discipline the words. So um, in the preface of the book, um, I began by saying, the object you are holding in your hand is conflicted. It is a performance yearning to be a document, a book. It is the printed artifact of the three Toni Morrison lectures I was invited by the Center for African American Studies to deliver at Richardson Auditorium and McCosh Hall at Princeton University. These spaces are intimate with 880 to 370 seats, respectively. My inclination in all performances to take into consideration the physical spaces themselves. This personalizes each performance and underlines a basic assumption I have that no time-based event can be separated from the when and where it is done. The lecture halls never became a theater. Still, they were arenas where many voices, my own being one of them, collided, protested, remembered, confessed, and defied each other. The lecture halls became echo chambers, complete with a sound installation that transformed and theatricalized the voices of which the text is composed. The purpose of this was to create an experience aimed at demonstrating as opposed to describing a manner of thinking, a way of being. Demonstrating 
opposed to describing. This object, this book, is an effort desiring to communicate directly, and still it remains indeterminate, in much the same way the dances I create for the stage do. These talks were described as a thought journey in pursuit of, quote, the life of an idea. It is the record of a needy, angry, and confused man. The need is for tradition and intellectual home. The anger is generated from an ever-maturing realization that I never truly had an intellectual home and never will. So the long and short of it is that um, part of the, the wonderful thing about being invited to do these lectures was it came with a book. They would be made into a book. So um, being a public speaker, you know uh, very well that what you say in a speech does not really come alive necessarily on the, on the page. Seems to be a leitmotif here, doesn't it? How, where does life exist? So that meant that once the speeches were given, I had, to, um, I had the, the pleasure of working with Fred Appel and uh, the, the design team at the Princeton University Press, and they pushed me, and they wanted more information. Uh, one thing about a performance is you can imply, and that's part of the beauty of it. You leave holes in it because the audience fills those. But for some reason, at least in a book like this, the, the uh, editors would ask, well, could you flesh out what you were getting at here? And I say, well, those places are like what I call the poetic places, uh, where you leave room for others to get in there. Well, you certainly do the poetic places wonderfully in the stories. You know, if you've mm -hmm. looked at this book, you understand that it's a series of very, of short one-page stories that are, each one is a novel. I mean, it's quite mm -hmm. amazing how, uh, how full it is and what a structure it has. And I'm going to ask you to read some in a minute. But I think the whole book has some progression in your being introduced to the, uh, John Cage as a person and as... A creator, and, and as a and point changing, of view, as and a as point a point of view, mm -hmm. and and you are changing over time in your attitude. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, let me let me read this. Um, the opening of the first lecture, the pastime, it starts with three quotes. What is the nature of an experimental action? It is simply an action, the outcome of which is unforeseen. John Cage from Silence. To take another man's ideas, to develop it, expand it, to impose on its logic a super logic, this does imply an element of criticism. Morton Feldman, Bula Bula, an essay from Give My Regards to Eighth Street. And then the third quote, the new confuses the old. Sometimes they enhance each other, sometimes they do just the opposite. Manet, for instance, because of, quote, the new, no longer, no longer looks so unfinished. Once again, Morton Feldman. The first time I heard or saw John Cage was in 1972 at SUNY Binghamton. How I, a theater dance major, happened to be present there in the student commons of the brand new college in the woods is a mystery to me 40 years later. I remember the long table at which John Cage sat with, I believe, David Tudor and several other musicians behind a bank of microphones, reel-to-reel -reel tape machines, amplifiers, a profusion of wires, and perhaps a traditional instrument or two. To the left of this table was a rowboat standing on its end. Next to it was a young woman in sweater and blue jeans. The room had been spe specially wired for sound with some speakers, most of them up near the ceiling. As I remember, the sounds were of nature in constant interactive flux with electronic drones, whirring, whines, tweets, and scraping metallic noise. At one point, one of the musicians ran a microphone round the contours of the boat, as he later did around the mildly embarrassed woman. During the evening, it was explained that the microphone was picking up frequencies bouncing off the boat and woman that fed back into the system. This caused a shift in pitch, timbre, and volume in the soundscape all around us as we stood or sat on the floor, chairs, and couches of this common room. Uh, two impressions stayed with me after the performance. The first was just how bewildering the event had been, and the second was a realization that I had been bored, and yet could not stop thinking about the event for days after. The event taught me that boredom is not a problem in and of itself. 
I start with this memory because the night proved to be a sort of second birth or coming into consciousness of the world of ideas or what one might call a tradition of artistic discourse. I cannot say I was really part of this tradition at this time. I was more like a newcomer, hearing the din and spirited exchange of a heated debate from an ante room. Now, well, that I must say, in and of itself, changed my attitude toward John Cage. <laughs> all right, I come from Toledo, all right? <laughs> and there are certain kinds of things, like people running wires around a boat on its end in a lecture hall and then around it, that make me say, that, that bring out the Toledo in me. It kind of, oh, give me a break, you know. <laughs> but, but what changed that for me was when you admitted that you had been bored mm -hmm. and then said, but why then could you not forget it afterwards? So suddenly I thought, aha, there's a purpose here. Mm -hmm. Is that what you experienced as a young man? Well, see, I thought that when I wrote this, I'd be writing it for an audience of people who have lived with modernism now for a long time. We all know that, and I've done it myself, when you ask an artist, well, what does it mean? They'll say, what does it mean to you? There is a participation, there's a door that's opened by that which is not so easy to understand or is not so available. When we were at the, um, up at a, a, minimum, uh, a minimum security prison, middle security prison upstate in Beacon, New York, as part of the Bard Prison Initiative, we did a performance in the gymnasium, and there were 200 of these men, pretty amazing story, some of you probably know it, these men are really um, getting, taking college level courses, they come out with degrees. Some of these men, I asked them, I said, but when are you getting out? Well, you know, they may be 20 years, they have to be in jail. I said, well, why do you bother studying? They said, because, man, that's not all I am. I'm not a prisoner. Right? And I want my children to know I got a degree. So that was, also, that was the first lesson. But then a man stood up and he said, so I understand why y'all came down here. But now when I go to my parole officer, the parole board, what should I tell them why it was important of me to be in the room seeing this? I've never seen anything like this before. So I was sort of began channeling all, everything that maybe you have talked uh, about the nature of democracy. And I say, when you sit in front of any event, and particularly an artistic uh, product, like a painting or a novel or a dance performance, and you have no idea what's going on, what resources do you use? In a way, it's like a lot of the world right now encountering democracy. We don't do it this way, you know? The Bible or the Quran tells me what should be, and I just follow. <laughs> Are you asking me to actually make up my mind about how I feel about things and make sense out of this world? Look how women are behaving. We know women are supposed to stay home with children, but look at around the world what they're doing. What am I supposed to do with this? I should kill them all? Or do, is there something I'm missing here? Art, I've always said, art was that. Art invites a person who is a member of a democracy to, to own up to that. How do you make sense out of it? So that's what I told him, that he should tell them, that he'd actually been exercising his democratic rights to be at a dance performance in a prison and being asked, what did you think about it? Mm -hmm. That's my feeling about art. That's what I think John Cage in those wires, uh, what he was going after. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it can seem to Toledo a little absurd, maybe pretentious, yeah, but you know what? I, I am an artist, and I think that, as I have said before, art does for me what religion traditionally did. It organizes a seemingly chaotic universe. It's not for everybody. That's so interesting, because yeah. what you've just described, I would say, is seeing the chaos in a seemingly orderly universe. I'm sorry? <laughs> no, no, what do you mean? Is, is seeing the chaos, you, you know, it's, it's like the new physics, everything is whirling in its place, there is no order, but there is peace. <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, religion to me is, is the opposite because it is about ranking people, not linking people, really. You know, it's, a, it's about rules and so on and so on. 
And what, what you and what you just described about art, I would say, is but I, the I opposite. I didn't go to people, though. I don't know what the meaning of my life is. I don't know if you all are even here, if it's only me. I, I'm saying I don't know. I think there is, um, there is a, the human condition is baffling and frightening. Artists take a stab at subjective meaning. And if it's infectious enough, artists can move people to think differently. Yeah, no, you know, I, it, yeah, I totally agree. I guess I just feel that sometimes the motive of some folks is not art, it's getting over. A lot of us. Yeah, I mean, it's, think, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's saying, okay, I once sat next to Andy Warhol at dinner. <laughs> uh, and it was a kind of served dinner, formal dinner, you know, people are walking around serving different courses. And he super conspicuously didn't take anything from any of the courses, right? And it was so clear, he was just waiting for someone to ask him why. Mm. And when finally someone asked him why, he said, I only eat candy. Okay, from that moment, I thought he was a fraud. <laughs> a total fraud. <laughs> and I still think so, you know, because it, it was a character. It was a, like a character fraud. Well, it might have been a performance, but was it necessarily a fraud? I mean, I think artists oftentimes uh, take on person. People take on personas, and there are people it's who do. It's true, it, but it, trust me, it was a fraud. <laughs> but, but what was but what was the fraud about it? You mean he doesn't really only eat candy? No, saying? the fr the fraud was about see how I can get people to pay a lot of money for. Uh, drawings my mother made and I signed them Andy Warhol's mother. See how I can get people to pay a lot of money for a photograph blown up that, you know, can you imagine if a woman artist had had a Campbell soup can enlarged? Can, I mean, I don't think so. All right, so I'm just saying, I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm, you know, I don't want to take a vote on Andy Warhol. I'm just saying that, uh, that I think the there is that motive counts you know there are, are are you trying to are we trying to express to reach each other to um you know or or is it quite the opposite are we trying to somehow make barriers between us by by my successfully deceiving you well i i don't know if we're going to in this yeah, maybe we shouldn't tonight. go down this. <laughs> because quite frankly, art is artifice. And there, that is what it is. You know, uh, we all have the same, we all have two legs, uh, some, the sexual apparatus, we have an ass, we have, and we have um, desires. We all have a lot of stuff that makes us the animals that we are, and so on. And then there are artists who actually are trying to, w using sometimes ruse, sometimes make-believe, sometimes a kind of bullying, sometimes to say, yes, but. Yes, but. But that's, uh, that's all trying to express. I mean, from our first handprints. But you don't think he was trying to express, no. even with his attitude? No. Mm. I don't. Th I mean, it was a hundred percent hostile, and so uh, okay. I'm sorry to get off on this, but it just because what you are doing is so different from that. I mean, mm. there, there's all these little wonderful one-page stories, as I was saying <laughs> in this book, and I just want to ask you to read. But before I, I read them, yeah. we have to deal with the perversity of John Cage. Okay. John Cage, yes. John, right. that, this whole and, reason for this book. And, this and your, yes, and your change in attitude over time toward John yes, Cage. Yes, well, let's okay. start. What, right. he, what he started with was saying, and it was a very important idea in his book, Silence, that there are three aspects of creation. And he said, composition was the most important. And he said it was uh, the only, the, work, the best work is made because it's necessary. And it's necessary because the artist himself, not the world, needs to discover something. 
That's the first one. Mm -hmm. Then he said that the execution is the next important thing. And he had his fights with people who didn't believe in what he was doing, but they were forced to play it. And he was trying to get people to, um, to approach it in the same way it was written. The third one, which is very controversial, is that um, the experience of the audience or the auditors is less important than the first two. What the audience gets out of it is less important than the first two things. Now that's a very particular kind of uh, mid 20th century idea. He around the time, in the, in the, let's say I think 58, uh, some people say 56, 58, 59, when he developed this idea of indeterminacy, he uh, read 90 one minute stories in 90 minutes. It became a kind of, he was known for his stories. He's a wonderful storyteller and he had to, to cook those stories down to one minute. And he related to it as music more than as content. I thought they're very much appreciated. Merce Cunningham did a, a, a wonderful performance using John Cage's stories. So um, people always think that I'm talking about Merce Cunningham, but I'm not talking about Merce Cunningham in my provocation. I'm saying John Cage thought that he was neutral and that he could um, tell stories uh, from, from some position of neutrality. I say that because of the particularities of myself, I'm a black man. I am, come from a certain class. Now he wasn't, that I don't feel like I'm neutral. Mm. I am not neutral. Mm. And uh, therefore I'm trying on his attitude, trying on his means of making. So why don't I write my stories? John Cage's stories are famous. Mushroom hunting, Zen Buddhism, things about the art world. He mentions also his mother. He, they, they, there's a great leveling in the way those stories are read and the way they're organized by random procedure. So, mm -hmm. being a bit provocative, right. I, I did this. this yes, thing. and I want you to, but I just want to say that only the powerful can claim neutrality. Hmm. I just, don't, you know, because it, it, we come with all kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. And the, my other problem with that is why does everything have to have a hierarchy? Why well, he was it, taking away hierarchy. No, he wasn't. He was saying it's most important, the creation is most important, then comes the execution, and the perception is the least important. The world is divided into categories of people, those who divide people into categories and those who don't. You know, mm -hmm. so why? why <laughs> well, see, one thing, you, one, thing that there are, uh, one thing we have to get over, uh, artists are not responsible to anybody. And in fact, he has every right to, yeah. out of all the possible ways of being, he says that he thinks that if things are going to be new, they've got to be new for mm -hmm. the artist first. Mm -hmm. The artist has got to get real with, he's making this to discover right. something. And I actually agree with that. I mean, it obviously that's the genesis of it. But it just troubles me that everything gets divided into most important, next most important, third most important. It, it, it's, it's more chronological or procedural. Of course, it starts you know, well, with a I, I unique could, individual. I right. may be, may be uh, misplacing an emphasis, but if he said, as some of us do, the most important thing is that I connect with my audience. We hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, there is a lively industry in Hollywood trying to figure out what's going to connect you to this product that we're making. Mm -hmm. So it's not noble in and of itself, mm -hmm. the fact that you start with connecting to the audience. I think there is something about saying, stop thinking about what they are going to get from it. What are you learning from it? Mm -hmm. Now, when he wrote these stories, so I thought with a plain face, I say with a poker face plundering of his idea, I would just write my own mm -hmm. stories and I'll, I'll read a couple yeah, of them. Yeah, no, I was just commenting on the, mm -hmm. I mean, it just seems more the order of events, you know, that you're, the genesis is with the individual and this, uh, and who knows what, what's most important, the impact on somebody else maybe. You know, I just don't see why we have to but how order does it, it. How does it get started? Yes, that's right. And that's, artists have, that's chronological, it's yeah. not 
Uh, but it's it's more than it, that. It, it, it's more than that. If I have to decide that I am a certain type, you can of see why we've known each other a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I have to decide as a certain type of dance person. Yeah. What do I think is worth doing? Mm. When I was 19, everybody was telling me, "Go to Alvin Ailey and let him finish you." <laughs> why? Because you're young, you're black. Mm. Right. Right. And at that time, I was with Arnie Zane. I was living the counterculture. I was offended. You know, I am not my body. Mm -hmm. You know, I am, nobody tells me because I'm black I have to go to Alvin Ailey. And that was a real, that's why this book. Yes, well, no, know? we are not categories. We are individuals. Each of us is a unique individual. And anytime we, groupism is, you know, sometimes practical, but certainly shouldn't be permanent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there are schools. Should I try to read three yes, of them? Please, yeah. um, now, I will not adhere to the one minute rule, but everything you, if you can look at this, whoops, Here, you know they are scored by the second. They are designed so that you can pick up the book and set a, a stopwatch and you could read them by the second. And they're great. They're little novels. You must, you'll see. Well, they were not designed to necessarily be great. They were designed to be as true as possible to a That's moment. Right. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, reality television is not necessarily great. It might be true, but it's not great, you know? It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> we could go on all right. You guys are gonna save us from ourselves. Right? <laughs> yeah, anyways, story number um, uh, in the book, in the section called Storytime, it's uh, number 765. In the summer of 1993, Arthur Bjorn and I were visiting Walter de Maria's lightning fields in southern New Mexico. We had reserved all six places in the guest house so we would have privacy. In the morning, Arthur had gone walking among the lightning rods. I was daydreaming when Bjorn called me to his room to help him with a panicked, white, vivid green hummingbird fluttering against the mosquito screen. A short while later, he had gently captured it and was cupping it in his hand when he offered it to me to do the same before we released it out the front door. I have seldom held a thing so fragile, so dependent on my care. I would like to think, as it grew quiet and still, it trusted me. Though even now, I can recall the rapid beating of its heart on my palm. Another one. It was the fall of 1974 in Binghamton. I moved in a fog of guilt and uncertainty, convinced that the only reliable life for me would be monastic. I was practicing yoga and chanting Hare Krishna daily. A guru had to be the solution after all. When a student is ready, the teacher appears. Alone down on my knees, performing my job at the university library, a voice said, I have been looking for you. I looked up into the face of a handsome East Indian man beaming down at me. I was thunderstruck. Actually, he had been looking for a space to conduct his meditation classes and someone must have told him I was a member of a dance collective with a loft in downtown Binghamton. I became one of his students, a vegetarian, and proposed celibacy to Arnie. One Saturday morning at a street fair, I bumped into Mirsa, my teacher, eating a hot dog and strolling with his wife. <laughs> I was shaken, though nothing was said then or later. He did teach me a number of mind-focusing exercises we saw less and less of one another, and then he moved away. <laughs> and the last one. Dora Amelon tells wonderful stories about her life. She is 90 years old, but remembers many details from her younger years. When she is enjoying a good meal, she will sometimes quote her father, Carl, who must have been quite witty with an ironic sense of humor, who, when asked how he was enjoying a delicious meal, would quip, there is better, but it is more expensive. <laughs> I had recently worked restaging a show at the National Theatre in London. My production supervisor was a delightful, warm, and very capable woman called Tanya. The opening night was triumphant. At the party afterward, we were all standing together having a drink when someone asked how I had found working with her. I was very happy with her and the whole experience at the National. So happy, in fact, that I decided I too would be ironic and humorous. There is better, but it is more expensive, I said. <laughs> I could see she was shocked. I tried to explain, but it was too late. 
You're not an old Jewish man, she said. Just say something nice next time. <laughs> Not great. Three novels. <laughs> All right. Shall we open it up to more discussion? Um, you can ask a question. You can give a answer. You can <laughs> whatever you wish. I don't really know how to use this, but um, okay. Um, maybe um, you guys can talk about back to Andy Warhol. Um, and it seems like there's some piece of narcissism that's involved in being an artist. Can you? Yeah, big piece. On that? <laughs> yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm I, I like to that, say that's what was in play there with his. Uh, rather than narcissism, I'd say self-involvement. Yeah. It wasn't to me, I, again, I'm sorry I got it, but my feeling for whatever that is worth at the time was not that it was, let me just, it, it was n not self-involvement or narcissism, it was mean. Oh, mean? Yeah, I mean, he was trying to put down where he was, be better than the people around him. Um, and it was also not at all spontaneous. It wasn't, you know, it was like something he'd uh, planned before he, yeah, before he got there. And so it didn't include those of us at the table who, you know, does, does that make sense? However, um, I, let me just say that when that woman shot him, I thought of that dinner party. <laughs> uh, however, however, Gloria, I would say, what, is there some connection between what you would call boorish behavior in him being an artist or just him being no, a man? No, it was right? character. Yeah, so, but I'm, I'm trying to, to I decouple, I didn't see decouple the art part. No, from you're quite, yes, Moore's thank behavior. you. No. No, that's much more relevant to your question. No, I did not for a moment attribute what, what? it to his being an artist, no. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I would say there are artists who are more self involved, less self involved. It's, a, it's sort of. Uh, it's it's a, a way a mode of human expression that expresses, you know, incredibly diverse people. Artists are oftentimes, well, sometimes. Why did you do that? You're trying to shock people, um, and that is, you know, it's a low blow, you know, because sometimes you you are aiming to do something that is going to maybe. I'm, let's leave Andy out for a moment. <laughs> Sometimes you feel that you need to act in a certain way because the situation is stifling. That there is an, uh, an unacknowledged assumption at play. Artists sometimes set themselves up as kind of arbiters of truth. And they do that by, I'm going to blow my nose in the tablecloth at Buckingham Palace, right? I know what that does. But then I have, I have justified somehow that it needs to be done. Or at least I need it as a space, you know? Um, I need it to clear the space for my personality. Um, do you know the story of Beethoven? Suppose, now, now you, you, you scholars, you can correct me, but the way I've heard the story was Beethoven and Goethe are at one of those very illustrious uh, spas and in the 19th century. And they're walking, and um, suddenly the Archduke and his family appears. Now, the writer, let's say it's Goethe, I'm not sure, steps off to one side and doffs his hat. Beethoven crosses his arms and walks right through the family. I am the genius here, he said. Was he doing it to get attention? Was he shocking? You know? Quite frankly, I'm here sitting years later rooting for Beethoven. <laughs> it was totally un, un, uh, inappropriate, right? I'm the artist, I'm the genius, and he walked through it. Convention, fuck convention, he said. Artists walk that line, you know? They walk that line. 
very beginning as we were talking about. Where's the empathy, where's the sympathy toward the other person? Mm -hmm. Who says oh. that you have to have empathy? Okay, sympathy. but remember, the other person was calling themselves a duke. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, royal titles are ridiculous, right? I mean in general. Oh. Yeah, but first of all, you assume <laughs> artists, artists win, that, particularly if you are a genius. <laughs> you know, I don't think the rules apply. I, I, I say this, and I say it, it, you know, I will suffer from this because I don't think I'm a genius. Um, I feel that artists sometimes are there to break things. And there's nobody said, who, there's a rule book that says you have to have empathy. No, 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 that's your choice. There are people who say, I don't have to have empathy. I just need to be effective at what I do. Now you have to make up your mind how you feel about them, knowing that about them. Can you listen to the work of an anti-Semitic, prolific, powerful artist like Wagner and not be reminded that he is an anti-Semite and that he, when I'm listening to some of his music, I don't really give a damn if he's a terrible person. I'm, what did he make? Now the rest of us are out here trying to balance, I think, that um, what I make and the way I am as a man or a woman, they've got to somehow, the, the math has got to work out. But not everybody is required to do that. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Mr. Jones. I wonder, do you feel like sometimes um, you're kind of yearning for justice? You have to put on one side of the room and you're yearning for artistic um, honesty on the other, depending on the, mm. the crowds you hang with. That's a three-pronged question, but... <laughs> but it's a very intelligent question. I mean, I'm question. a composer, so I, I find a lot mm -hmm. of times people involved in justice activism, which I am, are not necessarily sympathetic to the, now, once again, the honesty in art thing. And I thank you very much for the question. There is a... There is an, uh, Carol Becker, uh, who was an educator at the University of Chicago in the art department, she's now at Columbia, she had written a book about this, something about this, and she said, her um, theoretician, whose name escapes me right now, was known to have said, art making is, um, is pushing against something. And, she's, and someone said, oh, well, they were thinking, of course, she meant political art or what have you. And then he, they asked him, well, what about Cezanne? Do you know Cezanne's work? Uh -huh. You know, and he said, he thought for a moment, he said, it's a protest against sloppy thinking. So he, he doesn't have to go and change your relationship to the capitalism or what have you. If you are able to really engage Cezanne, your mind will, has to change. Now that's his feeling. Now so I would say if you are a social justice artist, make the best work you can and then let the devil take the hindmost. Nobody going to disagree with that one? <laughs> yeah? Yes. You, you've got me wonderfully challenged. I'm spinning, you know, both, both of you in the combination, and I'm feeling like my biases are all coming out and they're all being dumped all over the place. So a couple of things but encouraged me, brought me here a couple of questions even before I came here. You know, the two of you represent two icons of, in very different worlds. Well, one thing that you dropped slightly is your friends. Okay, I didn't think of that before I came. Hey, they're friends. You know? <laughs> okay, so now let's, you know, you can choose to explain, from what I understand, since my feeling is, and this is the most important one here, you know, you can choose to explain that friendship or not. And then on the beginning, Mr. Zhubinov, uh, but I'm thinking to myself now, words, words, words. What do words have to do with, with, with dance and movement? You know, and then I, I, I hear your words, and I hear just like we're born with natural movement. Your words have a natural movement, you know, a lightness to them or a, a plasticity mm -hmm. that other words don't. And so, but then I've created the reality to connect all these different things. Have I got it? Am I, am I listening well, or uh, am I sort of understanding? Um. Your, your experience is valid. Right. Yeah, and, and we... And just my experience. Yes. And I can't come to you to say, am I right about these things? But the fact that I'm noticing my experience well, is the most Bill important. Well, but Bill is a 
he's also a writer right. uh, and a lover, a lover a lover of words and um you know as as uh, and to me his dance is uh, you know about concepts and stories and human truths and it's it's not just it's never just decorative you know mm. so it doesn't it seems to me all, all of a piece did you meet over words i mean <laughs> in your early friendship i, I, I keep okay well yeah. no we shall we explain how we met? Please, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears how do you explain yeah, well it? <laughs> i i was uh uh interviewing um Patrick Kelly, the designer Patrick Kelly. Do you know, you know the designer Patrick Kelly? Wonderful, wonderful designer. African American was in Par was living in Paris and really having a great success there, as perhaps he would not have been able to have here. And very much designing in a, you know, all the other fashion designers in the world seem to me to be about dividing people up. You know, by saying, well, I'm wearing so and so, and it costs a lot of money. Patrick was u uniting people. He was uh, he was always using stretchy fabric, so women of all sizes, including his family, could, you know, um, and and big buttons, so you didn't have to have jewelry. And so, so I was interviewing him for television, and he was the partner. He's no longer living. He was the partner of Bjorn Amalan, who's here, Bjorn, right here. <laughs> and that's how we came to know each other, right? And so uh, Bjorn, uh, who's now Bilti's partner, this this was the human path, you know, of of just following people you admire and love and like, and figuring out that the people they fall in love with, you also love, right? Yes, it's right. true. That's true. And I was so, um, you know. We both brought to each other, Bjorn, who is now my husband, and I brought to each other's lives various things. Uh, one of the things he brought to my life was that- I was, that I was part of the dowry, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was really very, I was, I was thunderstruck, actually. I was so, but he knew Gloria, and it was, um, I was, it was a great privilege. And just like we talk now, you know, the, you know she's always a great teacher, and and that's that. and you know what might have been also interesting is that she was not in what we call the artistic sphere therefore she had a kind of a uh, you can see it in her you know her, her attacking all the orthodoxies of modernism you know that she's free of it so it made me really feel good to know her and listen to such an intelligent person who's not coming from that same place that I came from and er encouraging me you know you know to um, not let go, I'm a, I'm a child of potato pickers. And she, she saw that beauty in Patrick, she sees it in me, and she encourages those things. So I've, I've been very grateful for her friendship. Wonderful. This is the last question for the evening. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you too for being here tonight. This has been um, an amazing talk. Um, Gloria, I'm, I'm curious, uh, as someone who was not part of the artistic sphere, um, as you just said, sort of how um, Bill's philosophies of art have any bearing on your career or your creations, the um, sort of the mechanism of, of looking to express your truths first um, and the audience second or, mm -hmm. or anything like that. I mean, how has that influenced you? Mm. Well, I don't know. I just I I see his work and it touches me. I mean, just recently uh, I saw a a reperformance of uh, a piece about caring. How can we describe? It? It's about being a caregiver. Yes, it's a piece uh, called um, "Just You," which was a piece made uh, after my companion Arnie Zane had died. And it was a piece about caregiving. Um, I mean, it, it is the most expressive of what it's like to be a long-term caregiver and, and for someone you love, and how hard it is, and how irrational it is, and how your whole life is 
gone and yet you don't disconnect. I mean, you know, I had that experience too with the friend I married as we referred to each other. We never quite got to husband and wife actually. You know, um, who was very, very ill for a year and for whom I was caring. And he's just, so it was, the, it was and remains the only thing I've ever seen that expresses what it's like. The only thing. Mm. And so, you know, I was saying to Bill, you know, you, 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 must, you must give that back to us. And I think you feared that it was dated, you said. Yeah. I'm and I was saying, no, no, you know, it's not dated. I mean, look how, how many people mm -hmm. are in a caregiving situation, many, many more than before. So. Yeah. And that's what Gloria does, because she made me realize, that, well, well, maybe, Bill, the, you need to find the correct audience for it an audience that needs what it has to say, rather than this crapshoot, I make something, I throw it out in the world, and Darwinian forces, either it, it makes it or it doesn't. That's where the art is. Maybe some work is made mm -hmm. to, made for yeah, no, specific I think audiences. I, I, I mean, for instance, uh, Ai Jen Poo, whom you may know because she, like Bill, also won a MacArthur recently, and she is the great a great gifted organizer of uh, domestic workers, home care workers. She, you know, she's very, very, she's putting, I would say, you know, we lost, it was bread and roses once. She's putting the roses back with the bread. So she's a very uh, holistic, successful, wonderful organizer. Um, and she says that within 10 years we're going to need 90% more people who give care at home. And of course they must be, you know, well paid and cared for themselves, right? There's a huge, both because of the aging population and a lot of the workers are immigrant workers. I, it's just huge, huge, huge. We hear about how we need more high tech workers but we much more need more home care workers. So we, people want to stay at home and also they can be productive at home and also it costs $65,000 a year on the average to be in an institution. Probably all of us here would rather be at home than in an institution. All right, so there's this huge audience, I think, you know, for this wonderful, wonderful work. Mm. And so, you know, that, that's what I was, I was trying to express. Um, in answer to the first part of your question, I think in my heart I don't believe, well let me put it this way, what, what has been defined as art in the past, in, in the West anyway, was what white or European origin men did and it hung in museums and it cost a lot of money and it was removed from people and so on. Crafts were what women and natives did. But it's actually all the same. It's actually all the same. So, uh, you know, I would just say it's, it's human expression. Um, you know the Rubin Museum, which I love, lots of you know the Rubin Museum. They did a wonderful exhibit of the hand and footprints of the Buddha which, of course, handprints are the earliest form of art, I believe, you know, as far as we know, because our disposable, our disposable, no, it's not disposable, opposable. <laughs> opposable thumb is the mark of our humanity, so the handprint was the, apparently the first form of art. And this wonderful exhibit ended up with Grauman's Chinese. <laughs> Did it really? And since then, I have felt totally differently about <laughs> Grauman's Chinese. <laughs> because it's a human event, right? I thought you were going to say that they now think that those cave paintings, the actual people were either young children or women who were doing it because the handprints on the wall are the, the size of them. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's always turned out to be wrong, the interpretation of it. You know, the, in the, in the uh, uh, American Indian Museum in Washington, which I love, the, there's a lecture in the beginning, and it says, the guy, the native scholar is saying, you know, he said, there is history, and there is the past, and they are not the same. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. That's about all the time we have for this evening's program. On behalf of The Strand, Bill and Gloria, thank you so much for joining us tonight.